Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome, everybody. We'll start in a minute once everybody has dialed in. I think we have everybody on the on the call. Thank you very much for joining us on this webinar. I hope that everyone is safe and healthy during these tough times. Obviously, we're all getting used to working out of home, and I apologize in advance if you'll hear any noise in the background uh, during the webinar. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Reza Hakimian. I'm an, I'm an audit managing director with Deloitte and lead our private equity audit practice here in Boston. I'm also on the advisory board for the Boston Private Equity CFO Association. Over the last few weeks uh, since COVID-19 resulted in a major downturn in the economy, we have been bombarded with questions uh, from our clients um, about how to go about the Q1 valuations. I've also noticed that some questions did come through our Boston Private Equity CFO Association blog on this matter. So I volunteered to Heidi Diner from PECFA to put this webinar uh, for our Boston Private Equity community to go over some issues that would be worthwhile to consider. We have rushed to put, put this program together to make sure that the topics are still relevant for Q1 but also recognize that some of you may have already moved on to next quarter. But I promise you that the topics here would still be relevant for all. Uh, we have assembled a talented group of our valuation leaders and George Serianis um, uh, will be introducing them all shortly. But the topics, um, if we can move to the next um, slide, Um, um, but the topics here are going to be mainly focused on the valuation of uh, private equity investments. George and John will be leading those discussions and followed by valuation of private debt credit investments um, by, presented by Bruce Spector and then valuation of real estate investments by Nate, Nate Florio. I know we have some uh, participants on the call uh, from our DC community, uh, but there will be really little focus on the early stage VC investments as those would require a separate session, as you can uh, vouch. Logistically, all participants uh, are in mute, but uh, everybody has an opportunity to submit questions via the text uh, below your Zoom screen, right on the bottom you see um, an icon that says Q&A. So please feel free to uh, submit any questions during the session. We'll have enough time at the end to answer questions. Um, unfortunately, since we had to put this program together very quickly, um, we will not um, be able to provide any CP credit to you all. And I apologize for that. Something had to give. Um, we will you will receive a copy of the slides uh, via email after the presentation, so don't worry about it, you'll get the slides. And also please remember, we're not providing a one answer fits for all in this webinar, and therefore you need to discuss any specific matters with your auditors to get advice. On that note, I'll pass it on to George Sarianos to introduce himself and the rest of our panel and to kick it off. George? Thank you, Reza. So before we start, I would like to provide our thoughts and prayers to all those that are impacted by COVID-19. These are truly unique and challenging times and it's important that we all stand in support of those individuals that are in the front lines fighting you know, the bat battle against the virus. Good afternoon all, my name is George Sarianos and I lead Deloitte's Portfolio Relations Services Practice. I have over 19 years of experience working with, with asset managers and assisting with valuations, 
uh, of investments across various asset types, as well as developing and guiding through the implementation of valuation policies and procedures. Joining me on today's webinar are a few of my colleagues who will guide us through considerations that are impacting valuations in the current environment, including private equity, debt, and real estate. First, I would like to introduce John Swakowski. John is a senior manager with over 18 years of valuation experience focusing on the investment management sector, including valuations of carried interest and equity investments across multiple sectors and geographies. John will dive into considerations that we will need to, well, we will need to address in the valuation of equity interests. Next, we're gonna, we're gonna have Bruce Spector who will focus on the credit space and debt markets. Bruce is a senior manager who came to Deloitte after spending 25 years on Wall Street, where he ran several trading desks and originated and underwrote various loans and other credit type investments. And lastly, Nate Florio, who's Deloitte's Northeast real estate valuation practice leader, will walk us through the real estate markets and what he's seeing in that space as far as valuation is concerned. Next slide, please. So real quickly, prior to driving into today's topic, I want to take a quick second to provide an overview of Deloitte's valuation practice. We are the largest valuation practice with a network of more than 2,700 valuation professionals globally that bring both product and industry, industry experience to provide enhanced independent third-party valuations. We perform in-depth valuation analyses for all asset types for clients across the spectrum of pension funds, hedge funds, private equity firms, and banks globally. If it's an illiquid asset, we can value it. In addition, we also spend approximately 400,000 hours assessing valuations in support of our audit clients. This provides further insight and experience when delivering independent valuations to the market. Next slide, please. And just as Reza point out, you will be receiving these slides after the webinar. So I apologize for a lot of information being put onto, onto the slide here, but you know, to start with the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in unprecedented volatility in today's markets. And the corresponding market uncertainties which have required asset managers in general to give careful consideration to valuation analyses and inputs. The decrease in market prices has been accompanied by a significant increase in volatility, driven by the uncertainty of the extent and duration of the crisis. One just has to look at the bottom right gra graph showing the movement in CBOE volatility index, which is also known as the fear index over the last 20 years. Current observed volatilities are in line with what we saw during the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. As a result of increased uncertainty and abnormal market movements, observed market declines and increased volatility we, with, which will result in important applications for your portfolios, especially as they pertain to the value you're carrying your investments. Further exasperating valuations is the expected scrutiny that you're gonna receive from third parties, including regulators, auditors, and investors. Next slide, please. While we are seeing a market, market capitalizations that are being driven downward by scared investors fleeing what someone may say is a medically driven event rather than a financial one, at least for the moment, the means for handling the crisis from a valuation perspective are part of the standard processes typically used to price these assets. In other words, the main tenets of valuation have not changed because of the current crisis. So what do I mean by, so what do I mean by this? Well, the definition of fair value hasn't changed. It still is the price that would be received to sell an asset or pay to transfer a liability in an early transaction. Fair value is not a fire sale. Fair value takes into account current market conditions. We need to understand the factors impacting the business. We still need to understand the environment in which the business is operating. And lastly, we have to understand how the impact of the crisis is felt within the industry and any competitors. 
a robust value and evaluation analysis that is transparent and fully documented regardless of the current prices would be underpinned with significant conservation of the above items just mentioned. So in other words, nothing's changed from prior periods as far as what needs to be done from a valuation perspective. Also, what is critical for the investment manager to consider is that they're aligned with the value, they're aligning their valuation with the portfolio company response. So questions that need to be asked is, is the business providing updated financial data? Does the decline trigger potential goodwill impairment for the portfolio company? And lastly, how does the investment manager's outlook for the business compare with company management's assessment of the situation? Now, I appreciate this might be a hard one to obtain, especially if you're a minority holder and typically don't have access to projections. But any information into the company's view of, the value, of their valuation and their future operations will assist in your valuation. Next slide, please. So as we embark on performing our valuations, we need to take, into, take inventory of the factors that will have impact on our analyses via inputs and methodologies. These factors can be split into two categories what is currently known and what isn't. When we look at known factors, we see that the markets have declined significantly across asset classes, which should give you an indication, at least directionally, as to how investments should be marked. Certain industries were significantly impacted while others were not, or have even done better in the current environment. If you're Amazon or Costco, you're flourishing. Obviously, Carnival Cruises is a different story. Oil markets have declined concurrently. If you are tied to the sector, it shouldn't be a surprise if you haven't already contemplate taking a full impairment on the investment. Next up, the liquidity concerns. These are becoming more apparent and companies were making efforts to assess cash burn. We're also seeing many companies reaching into their revolvers and taking out the full amount of the revolver. To, me, to make sure they have enough in, for, for cash burn. Next up is volatility. Volatility and certainty around it have increased, which have increased. This means investors are expecting higher rates of return, which would equate to potentially higher discount rates in cash flow models. And lastly, governments across the world are developing and executing on stimulus packages for businesses and individuals. Now moving to the unknown that's gonna impact our valuation. And these include when the vaccine or other treatments would be available to slow or stop the spread of COVID. This represents a timing issue for forecast, forecasting and when the return to normalcy, whatever that may, might entail. How long shelter in place and business closures would remain in effect? We are starting to hear about plans to slowly reopen the economy. So you have to ask the question, could we see a resurgence, resurgence of cases as people start to interact? The final to toll of COVID-19 on the economy is not known. It is not sure how long the recession or downturn will persist, and therefore how long will that have impact on the operations of the underlying portfolio company? And lastly, the last two items, when we look at what the full impact of the government stimulus packages will be, as well as what are the long-term effects on various industries. These are truly unprecedented times, and we don't believe we're any near fully understanding what will, this, what will this end up meaning for several industries out there, such as travel and leisure or hospitality. And with that, uh, I will pass on to John, who will walk us through considerations when valuing equity investments. Great, thanks, George. Uh, next slide. So whenever we have a situation like this, I think we try to draw parallels back to things we, we've been through or, or you know, seen before, and the, the likely culprit here is 2008, 2009. Um, what we're seeing really is that the reaction from you know, private equity shops, from specialists like ourselves or, or law firms, is, is that the response has been very quick 
a lot of people rushing to get out in front of this versus, you know, I think the response is a bit slower, you know, 10 years back. And that's because a lot of these impacts are really tangible, fungible impacts that you can clearly see impacting the business versus, you know, maybe some economic contagion risk or, you know, there was a lot of ability previously to sort of say, yeah, that's happening to these firms because of the markets, but that doesn't impact our company. So what we have here are things that really do impact our companies. You've got everything from store closures or, you know, operating on reduced, um, reduced hours or reduced work, uh, loss of customers, uh, so things that are actually impacting sales, uh, supply chain and distributor interruptions. You know, even if you could get your job done, if you can't do that, if you're, you know, you can't get product in, and those things are having actual legitimate impact on your business. Um, production delays, the, the impact on human capital, and this is a giant uncertainty, you know, workers being furloughed, a lot of uncertainty in terms of when we'll be able to bring them back in and what that means for, you know, our business and, and the future of the, the workforce of our businesses. And then there's, you know, this sort of idea of regulatory changes. You know, a lot of governments are putting in place packages uh, for stimulus. There may be new regulations tied to these, and there's still a lot of uncertainty around how that's going to impact us on a go-forward basis. And as George alluded to, this, this causes everything from cash burn concerns, you know, liquidity, um, You've got to worry if you're, you're going uh, to be violating any debt covenants and, and how you're going to get through those. And, and Bruce can cover that uh, in his section as well on the impact on debt. But, you know, what we're seeing is there's uncertainty and we expect, and, and we're starting to see it already as Q1 results roll in, but people, you know, we have guesses. At 331, you had an expectation of what was happening. You might not have a bead on the magnitude, but you knew directionally. Uh, we're seeing a lot of that become more concrete. We'll see things that we were speculating about materialize one way or another. And so as we go into Q2, there's going to be a lot of this, you know, true up or reconciliation of, of how we were thinking about it at the end of, end of the first quarter with, you know, reconciling it with now what is known and you know, how those, those facts have hardened up uh, and how they're going to impact us in Q2. Uh, next slide. The next couple of slides here cover really things we've seen, problems we've seen with Q1, you know, a lot of it on the data side um, and, and ways you can address that or, or ways you want to consider that. Because, you know, as, as George said, this is kind of tied to this is everything you should be doing anyway. This is all part of your standard valuation process. It's just a much more extreme version of it. <laughs> so the first one I want to talk about is, you know, a lot of companies price using historic multiples. And you're lagging, your, your LTM or other multiples, especially at Q1, are lagging. Uh, your market caps are all down. And you'll see in the top line here of, of the little table, we've got a market cap that's down maybe 20%. Um, nothing else has changed though, because all the, the rest of the data, your debt number, your EBITDA metric, those are all pre COVID. So what you'd see is that, you know, while the market cap has dropped, your EBITDA on a historic basis might not have changed. So you're, it's not quite an apples to apples uh, comparison here and your multiples therefore are lagging and they're going to be down relative to where they were pre COVID. And, and again, this is a generic example. Um, and probably applicable for, for most industries. Now, what this means, it, there's no right or wrong way to account for this. All that's important is that you do account for it and you, you're you know, really tracking how you're getting through this, how you're reconciling what the comparable company data is showing you with the data you're looking at on your end. Um, so if you're using a, you know, a lagging multiple, what should you be applying it against? Should you use a reduced forecast or should you use a, an adjusted EBITDA number that's going to re, in, you know, have some impact of COVID built into it? Uh, because if you do that, you might be taking a double dip against you know, the market movement. So you know, the, the real takeaway being, you want to know the data that's going into your analysis and, and the timing of it and what it's really telling you. And you want to make sure you're looking at your own company data on an apples to apples basis so that you're not misjudging uh, the impact here. 
Uh, next slide. The other, the other end of this is, you know, forward-looking estimates. And, and a lot of you who would use forward-looking estimates get that data from Bloomberg or capital IQ sources maybe. And, and that is, you know, the, the problem we have there it's again making sure you've got this apples to apples comparison that we talked about with the LTM multiples. But what we've seen is as of 331, you know, a company might have eight analysts covering it and only, you know, two or three of them had updated numbers. And so whatever you were getting for a consensus EBITDA estimate or consensus price was only partially reflecting COVID because a lot of them hadn't been updated for a few months. And so there was a mismatch of, you know, those forward metrics not incorporating, you know, a full post-COVID view. Uh, so a lot of the analysts have been quick to catch up on this. Changes had been made. It wasn't quite there at 331. And obviously, as you get into the second quarter, we, we expect that most of them would have updated, uh, updated analyses. Um, you'll see Cap IQ and Bloomberg and others will actually be able to break that data down for you. Uh, you'll be able to go in and say what, you know, what analysts are going into this estimate, when did these reports come out, and, and use that again. Similar to the LTM multiples, you just want to make sure you're thinking apples to apples and you're really comparing your, your market data and your company data on the same outlook. Uh, next slide. So on these two, you know, the, the big one here, Guideline transaction multiples. We've been getting a lot of questions on these. Um, the general consensus being, can I use them? And the, or rather, the, the question being, can I use them? And the consensus being, you probably shouldn't. Um, it's not to say you couldn't build a case for why this prior transaction is the best indication of value, but you really need to bake in what's been happening. Um, and that that transaction multiple would likely not occur right now. Uh, we are seeing things like higher premiums being paid over depressed market prices, but you know, it's very tough to rely on anything that's happened you know, prior to March of this year and, and hold it out as representative of fair value now. Um, I guess the other, you know, maybe a follow-on point on that is that the market has, has really come to a, pretty much a standstill and, and we don't know when good transaction multiples will come out. So we are going to emphasize, you know, don't use the old multiples yet, or if you're going to use them, you know, you really need to calibrate them against what's been happening. So it, it's going to be tough to say, uh, you know, we can justify a 10x multiple that was paid last fall even uh, in the current environment. Um, final point here, income approach. and. and Again, as mentioned, it's the use of an income approach is going to tie to your reliance on forecasts, your ability to access uh, cash flow forecasts. But in this case, they are a much more direct way of, of accounting for what's happening. You know, you're not necessarily trying to cram everything going on into one, you know, EBITDA or revenue metric and one uh, multiple. You've got, you know, a couple of years and you can model out different scenarios to say, well, maybe maybe we get a faster recovery and, and the business looks like this. Maybe we get a slower recovery um, and it's extended out a little more, but you're able to, to really fine tune it and, and potentially get a, you know, a more uh, nuanced look at what's going on. Uh, one other key factor on the income approach, uh, Deloitte and, and a few other firms, I know we've all been adjusting up our risk premium. So the discount rates you're using even if the market data hasn't reacted as quickly, should incorporate this additional risk of uncertainty uh, in the market, uncertainty in the projections, um, and you know, I think minimum ERP premiums, so the equity risk premium, uh, we've seen those go up about 100 basis points, and that's not even capturing you know, company-specific factors about uncertainty in your forecast. So again, the, the takeaway on that is, you'll get more nuance out of it, but also, again, be aware of what the market data has built in and doesn't, because it's not going to reflect, you know, the, the COVID risk or the risk of the current environment. And so you want to think about that when developing a discount rate. Um, that 
that's kind of it right now for the high level private equity thoughts. Uh, turn this one over to Bruce now and he'll talk through private debt and credit. Thank you, John, appreciate it. I very much appreciate the opportunity to present views on the valuation of private debt and credit products and to explain why private debt and credit products may be overly penalized due to recent COVID related events. Current markets present somewhat unique challenges to the valuation of debt and credit products. And my hope is the views offered today will help you with reporting and in conversations with third parties such as auditors, both now and in the future. The disruption in business activities associated with COVID-19 has adversely affected the public debt markets. This presents great challenges. The most common practice used to value private debt is to identify traded company uh, comparable securities, which can be issued by public companies or indices composed of public securities, which match attributes such as sector or credit rating. However, the use of publicly traded debt in public indices and even loan market data, for example, as reported by LCD, to value private debt can act to exaggerate movements in, movements in credit spreads and adversely affect valuations, which depend on the use of these securities. Further, as market volatility has increased, some public debt has traded less frequently, putting the integrity of their traded prices and the indices on which they are populated into question. All of this can contribute to the risk of overstating discount yields and unduly penalizing the value of private debt investments beyond the level associated with the temporary circumstances of the COVID-19 virus. And I would say to the point where the price of performing debt may appear distressed and warrant assessment using such approaches as a recovery analysis. Unless investments reside in industries which are truly impacted on a longer term basis, such as oil and gas, travel and leisure, or bricks and mortar retail, the valuation of private debt requires the triumph of experience over model mechanics. Private debt can represent less risk than comparable public debt exhibit less volatility and retain greater value than would be indicated by reported public data. Our experience shows that investment professionals know this. However, selecting appropriate comps and accounting for structural differences, for example, in order to quantify this difference so it is audible, auditable is key. Applying a covert overlay of several hundred basis points to the discount yield is not the solution. Here are some thoughts on how to address this question. We can go to the next slide. First, it is important to make the case the investment you own is not as volatile as the comparable security selected. By doing so, by doing so you can translate lower volatility into lower, more appropriate discount yield changes period over period and reduce the negative impact of swings in valuations. Consider ratings adjustments. If you use public securities or indices to trend changes in yields, then consider adjustments for rating differentials. Unless securities and indices are truly comparable, then the stated or implied rating on your investment is likely different than the comparable securities and therefore the movement in public market spreads will overstate declines in private debt investment prices. So, evaluate collateral and structural protect protections. Under published credit rating agency methodology, collateral and structural protections may support a credit rating one to two and possibly even three notches higher than the selected publicly traded debt. The benefit to your valuation is that a higher rated security should experience lower volatility, lower changes in spread movement than that presented by lower rated public markets debt. Adjustments based on publicly available data sources can then be applied to quantify what in effect is a seniority premium versus the public debt and indices. And remember, there are hidden illiquidity premiums. One component of the investment IRR, the day one IRR, is associated with an illiquidity premium. Counting this premium towards the credit risk spread exaggerates the credit risk 
and overly reduces the implied credit rating. Again, this has the negative impact of, redu of introducing greater volatility into calculations of spread movements and increases result in discount yields. So the comments I just made permit quantifiable adjustments to discount yields that are auditable. The comments that follow permit you to directionally bias your discount yield range higher or lower. So for example, the generally smaller size of the investor group in a private debt issuance and their commensurate ability to act in response to changing borrower needs has always been a source of strength for private debt versus public markets where the investor base can be widely dispersed. The ability to quickly and efficiently act has value. And while it's hard to quantify the impact of small versus large creditor groups, the presence of this factor is something that can be used to directionally pull your value in one direction or the other. Third, who the investors are in private debt and depending on their buy and hold mentality will impact their sensitivity to market events. So for the most part, investors in private debt understand the intrinsic value of their investments and are more likely to hold their investment through periods of volatility. And yes, the liquidity premium component of yield will rise as volatility increases and market depth reduces. But the presence of a buy and hold investor group may help to smooth the impact of short-term volatility, which is exhibited in the public markets where investors react to negative events by just dumping securities. If you can go to the next slide. The US government's response to the COVID crisis is highly fluid, but given the focus of the government on helping at-risk sectors such as travel and leisure, valuations on private debt should not move by levels approaching those in public markets. There will likely be bankruptcies of companies in the EMP sector along with travel and leisure and traditional bricks and mortar retailers, and overall bankruptcies have reached 3%. And COVID-19 may have a longer and deeper financial impact than the 2008 recession. However, one only needs to look at the last financial crisis to see how much better loans performed than publicly traded securities. CLO equity was unimpaired during the last financial crisis. And substantial investment management cash piles are primed to pick up distressed businesses and increase existing positions quickly supporting market prices. Directionally values in many cases declined in March, but have partially rebounded in April. Investors need to be prepared for volatility and the associated impact on investment valuations. But the key to valuation is to build the story. And this is the same thing that John was saying around why a particular investment is less sensitive and therefore should hold its value more than the overall market. I thank you for the opportunity to speak today and now I'm happy to introduce Nate Florio from our real estate practice. Thanks Bruce. Hi everyone, I appreciate your time today. So I wanna to start with a brief overview of what we are seeing in the real estate markets and hearing from our real estate clients then discuss some of the challenges with obtaining data and valuation assumptions for first quarter and second quarter real estate valuations. Real estate assets and their values generally do not move as quickly, nor are they as subject to market volatility swings as some other real estate investments are. These assets are typically encumbered by leases, which make their cash flows easier to estimate. However, the valuations rely on comparable sales and capitalization rates which are generally derived from historical data and lag the current market. We've been very busy working with our real estate owner and investor clients, as well as our clients that are real estate users and lessees over the last month and a half, discussing various real estate issues. To walk through some of, some of the issues facing various asset classes. So for retail assets, it's really been a, a tale of the have and have nots. Uh, enclosed malls filled with non-essential businesses are being hardest hit. Retail spaces such as grocery anchored centers and or pharmacies are fearing, faring much better. Analysts are worrying that the pandemic will expedite retailers and consumers move away from bricks and mortar space into online sales. 
we're helping several large retail owners work through just a massive number of rent relief requests and also a lot of tenants in actively reviewing their leases for clauses that will allow them relief, forbearance, or break clauses in their documentation. The retail space will continue to feel this pain for some time. For office users, the question is, will the experience of prolonged physical distancing cause them to reassess their office space needs? Large users are planning phased move backs and, and perhaps moving certain team members outside of major or densely populated cities. At the same time, certain users are noting that they expect to cut back on space sharing requirements, which may cause the need for more office space for certain users. So I think that the office space will really be in flux until we see a little more how this plays out. For residential real estate, multifamily has seen varying effects based on government rent and or non-eviction orders. That, that vary state by state and location by location. Um, although April collections exceeded some early expectations for most users, but May may be a different story as unemployment systems and government assistance is, is lagging original timelines. The most effective property types we're seeing are as expected. Retail, as I've already discussed, hospitality, gaming and transportation industries, um, such as hotels, casinos, parking garages, uh, really seeing the biggest effect as a lot of these are deemed non-essential and tourism has been greatly reduced as well as business travel. The least effective property types have been digital real estate, data centers, cell tower owners, communication asset owners uh, have seen just the increased need for quality data capabilities and bandwidth at many more locations be an upside for these industries as well as warehouse and logistic properties as online retailers refine their channels for faster and more reliable delivery needs. So moving on to the data issues that we're seeing for the first quarter and expect to see for the second quarter valuations is that we will see limited transaction activity during this time due to the uncertainty of the business operations at various property types. We aren't seeing many new deals being agreed to and we are seeing previously agreed upon sales not close. For first quarter valuations, we did not see a lot of clients incorporate major changes in cap rates or terminal values into their projections and valuations, as many felt they didn't know enough at 331 to adjust these assumptions. However, we're stressing that they revisit this in the second quarter. We are working with clients on foc to focus on adjusting their cash flows, especially in the vacancy and collection loss areas, occupancy and rent growth line items as they go through their forecasts in their cash flows. We've seen forecast effects ranging from short-term blips in some industries to longer-term recoveries with several of our hotel owners and users estimating that 2019 income levels may not be reached again until 2023 or 2024. Lastly, the lack of available mortgage financing will cause lingering issues and further distress in the real estate market as owners with short-term mortgage rollovers will have challenging time refinancing with lower valuations while mortgage and CMBS markets are limited. All these things will lead to a challenging time estimating real estate values for first quarter and second quarter. Uh, next slide. So just want to share some interesting data that we have seen in the last few days, which highlight the challenges that we'll be facing the real estate markets and the valuation of real estate assets during this time. So in the top left, you'll see the number of buyers in the real estate market fell off of a cliff uh, in February and March, and we saw a spike in deals collapsing. Moving to the top right, we'll see that the April rents received for office and healthcare were down less than 90% of those rents were received and retail collections were down to less than 50%. Apartments and, and industrial remained relatively strong. And I think the question is, is how this changes in May as this continues to play out. The graphs at the bottom of the page, we'll see that CMBS loans 
that are 30 days late are increasing rapidly from March to April with the two biggest classes obviously being hotels and retail, but even multifamily industrial being close to 5%. And, to, and the, lastly, the graph on the bottom right shows that availability of mortgage and loans to fund new transactions has all but dried up as, as only the best properties and the best borrowers could obtain a mortgage at this time in CMBS markets and, and other markets that, that fund, especially mortgage REITs and other institutional investments are dry. So all these factors collectively will lead to a challenging environment through the rest of uh, people who are finishing up their first quarter valuations and those that move on to their second quarter valuations and going through and estimating and obtaining the data necessary to support and truly get to real estate valuations that make sense for second quarter. So I'm gonna turn this back over to Reza for Q&A and to close it out. Thank you very much, uh, Nate, appreciate it. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, you have the ability to submit further questions by um, submitting it through the button on the bottom of your screen. We have received some questions and most of these are related to the private equity side. So maybe uh, John and George, you can address these. Um, one is for those firms that use multiple valuation approaches, is it anticipated that a larger weight could be given to the income approach versus the market approaches in Q1? Meaning that the guideline transaction technique may be less meaningful? John and George? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll take that Reza. I think, you know, the important thing as, as with any time you're using multiple approaches and weighting them is to, to go with what you are A, more comfortable with, and be where you have the value or the, the data to really support it. Um, so in a case where you're, you know, you expect less reliance on the guideline transactions, if you're using an income approach and you feel that that is giving you, you know, a more nuanced look at the business, you should probably place more emphasis on it. Or, you know, again, as with everything else we talk about, document how this was all considered and, and in, you know, reconciling the two values you might be getting from different approaches. Okay, another question um, is back to the guideline transaction technique. You mentioned that the guideline transaction technique is not as meaningful considering the drop in the public comps um, and uh, the M&A transactions are less meaningful, the historical M&A transactions are less meaningful, but should they be considered um, but applying a discount to them as one could challenge that the guideline public comps, that going public comp um, are not too representative of the multiples to buy and sell. Yeah, I think it's it sort of falls into this, you know, and we haven't really talked about calibration here, but this idea of all else equal, you should be, you know, moving with the comps. And so if you are going to use the transactions, yeah, you need to, to factor in everything that's happened. If you were pricing, you know, X in relation to this transaction previously, um, you should probably have that same gap all else equal. Um, so it, it can be done and you can place a discount. Maybe the other point to be aware of is whatever you're doing in that can, case is subjective. And it's something else that's going to have to be supported, you know, for audit or, or for your investors uh, to justify, you know, where did you get that discount from and what's it based on. And, and, and John, I think, the, again, the key element is that the historical M&A comps and those are history, right? Going forward, really, nobody is transacting at those multiples. So if somebody wants to use those and applying a discount, the issue is the subjectivity of that discount, how you're gonna support that. But I think this goes back to reconciling the different approaches if you're using you know, the public comps versus that, at least bringing them close to each other. Yeah. And 
and George, I'm going to probably pass it on in a second to see if you have any questions for Bruce um, or uh, Nate. But there's one other question quickly on the private equity side is that, and I know I've seen this, um, um, you know, on the in the blog, I think, for the Private Equity CFO Association, too, that, you know, if we know that, you know, John, you discussed that the public comps uh, in Q1 uh, show a decline in the multiples because of COVID-19, because primarily because the stock prices are down. But are these representatives of multiples that willing buyers and sellers transact? Will firms be willing to sell at these depressed multiples? Can you elaborate on it? Sure. Yeah, Reza, I think that the key point is that it's, you know, it's still fair value. The premise we're working under is fair value. It's not fire sale. And, you know, you're, it, it's, it, you're not necessarily stuck with you know, the same, um, you know, magnitude. You don't have to take this incredibly depressed value, you know, raw data and assume that no one's going to evaluate it, you know, on its own merits or, or in light of other factors. Okay, thank you. George, uh, George do you have any questions for Bruce, by any chance? Any? I don't see any other questions online. Um, it seems we are about 10 minutes ahead of the schedule. If there are no so, other questions. Sorry, Reza, George? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, I was um, muted for a second there. Uh, so I do have a question for Bruce on the credit side. And I think it's it, relevant as far as, you know, considering how on the equity side of things we would expect cash flows to be adjusted, uh, at least for the near term, for impact and revenues and, and uh, other items within the, the P&L. Uh, Bruce, on, on the debt side, uh, what are you seeing managers account, how are they accounting for COVID-19? Are they adjusting the cash flows and expected timing of cash flows? Uh, are they making adjustments to yields uh, further than what let's say the ind indices or comparable yields have performed. What, what are you seeing in that space? Sure, George. And that's, it's, it's, it's an important point because um, we're seeing a full range at this point. And I think partly that's because the easiest thing to do is to throw an overlay on and say, look, there's obviously more risk. Therefore, we're just gonna hit the discount yield and we're gonna drive that up and we're going to push our values down. Um, the The issue there is that it's it's very much um, not transparent, not auditable, not sustainable. Right? When do you put it on? When do you put it off? How much do you put on? How much do you pull take off? So it's we we try very hard to 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 not use it for our external engagements, and certainly uh, for the ones who are working in audit reviews, we're pointing it out and identifying it as an issue and looking for support for it. The the challenge with uh, whether you adjust cash flows or the discount yield, you know, you know, John was talking about calibration and calibration is what informs a trending analysis where you're going from one period to the next and you're looking at how comps have changed. Therefore, uh, ergo, the, the change should flow through to the private debt investment. And what we're seeing is that because uh, the, the, the indices and the comps that are used uh, for the most part up until the COVID crisis um, hit in late February, early March, what we see is that comps that aligned very well in a very stable environment did not do well <clears throat> during the COVID crisis, meaning that as, as ratings uh, widened, as the differential in yields, uh, the credit spreads widened between different ratings uh, categories, you saw that certain ratings categories were blowing out and therefore the volatility introduced by that meant that the, the, the use of those comps and hitting the discount yield made it much more difficult, which is why I'm talking to trying, 
uh, using processes where you can reduce that volatility by truly getting to what is the, the implied rating of your investment, right? It's, it's several notches above. If you hit the cash flows, there's, you know, you have to be careful because some of the of a discount yield is default risk. And therefore, you have to be careful that if it's minor, right, we're just going to then be uh, uh, doubling down on uh, impacting the valuation. And that's, you have to be careful. With, we don't want to do that. But we're seeing investments that are in uh uh, international jurisdictions, local in the United States, whether their sectors are travel and leisure, or they're related to real estate, or they're related to uh, retail, etc., where we are having to work through uh, with the investment managers uh, adjusting the cash flows. And there, it's a real issue. Now, in some cases, it's a timing issue. Um, so we may get it back uh, later on, but but we're having to look at it on a case by case basis, and I think that's the level of detail that people are doing now. Where six months ago, when things were nice and stable, it was not as it was not as it wasn't as necessary, right? And so these are good practices to put in place now going forward. And it, you know, the more detail, as John pointed out, that you can provide as part of the valuation, the, the fewer questions and the fewer uh, concerns there'll be from an audit perspective in, in, you know, when reviewing that valuation. Great. Well, it seems I don't see any other questions online. Um, so I'm we're at the end of our session. I wanted to thank you for participating in this webinar. Uh, this concludes our session and have a great evening. Thank you very much.